Welcome to the Find Your Voice, Change Your Life podcast with psychologist Dr. Doreen Downing. Listen in as Doreen interviews people who felt they didn't have a voice or who suffered extreme speaking anxiety. You'll hear stories about how they struggled to speak up, what they did to find their authentic voice, and the confidence they now feel to speak up and make an impact. If you want to get started right away to find your voice, download Doreen's free 7-Step Guide to Fearless Speaking at Doreen7Steps.com. And now, here is Doreen. Hi, I'm Dr. Doreen Downing, and I'm host of the Find Your Voice, Change Your Life podcast. I've been a psychologist for 45 years, believe it or not, and now at this stage in my life, I am bringing all of that kind of listening I've done in my office to my podcast guests. I love to create a safe space for them to dip down into something that, oh, maybe might be more hard to reveal in public, but they finally get to tell the truth, the truth of their story. And today I have a very special guest who is somebody I've met recently, and I'm so excited to hear his story about having lost his voice. And this is Paul Hood. Hi, Paul. Hi, Dr. Doreen. How are you? Oh, it's a wonderful day here in California. Excellent. And where are you from? Well, while it appears that I am at the beach, that is wishful thinking or wishful video. I'm in Sylvania, Ohio. Ah. Um, But being a Louisiana native, I spent a lot of time on the Florida pan in the Florida panhandle in an orange beach, Alabama. So Uh the beach was not an unfamiliar place for me to be. Oh, well, I'm glad you're in a, in a setting, at least video background there that uh, brings good memories back to you. Hopefully, if not, we'll. Oh, it does. No, no, it does. Good. Yeah. I see the smile on your face. Let me tell the, the folks who are listening to something about you. Paul is an author, speaker, and consultant on tax, estate, and charitable planning. He is also a vice president with Thompson & Associates, a charitable estate planning firm. And Paul, you've written or co-authored nine books, and the ninth one is just out, and it's called Yours, Mine, and Ours, Estate Planning for People in Blended or Step Families. And I just want to give people your website right here is paulhoodservices.com. But there's something you also wrote to me, and I want to say it. It's going to, it's going to take a couple of breaths here, but You are a father, a husband, an uncle, a godfather, a lawyer, trustee, a member, a director, a president, a partner, trust protector, director of planned giving, expert witness, agent, professor, judge, juror, respondent, and a defendant. And he uses his experiences in these myriad roles to guide others. And I am so glad we set up this conversation so that we can get started on you taking the stage to share your story. Well, thank you. I'm looking forward to it. Mm -hmm. Usually, since it is about finding your voice or losing your voice or never having had a voice and finally finding it, let's just start with uh, the the sense of what happened to you that you feel like either you didn't have a voice or you lost it? Well, there were a number of factors that kind of operated simultaneously. Um, But the seeds were sown years before. Um, A bad marriage decision uh, was one of them. A decision to elope was another, and then um, a decision to leave a law firm um, to go solo uh, with a four-month-old. And um, while I was strong enough, client-wise and as a lawyer, 
to handle all that, it eventually, because the marriage wasn't right, it eventually broke down. Um, it kind of operated like hyenas attacking a lion. You know, if a bunch of them jump on the lion's back and they're all clawing, eventually they're going to take him to the ground. And that's what happened to me. That's essentially what happened. Well, that's a, a broad and dramatic picture that you've just painted. And we'll go into some of the details if you're willing, which I would invite you to do. But uh, sure you're I right. Am. You're right. You're right. You're right about life having roots of uh, whatever is eventually happening to us. We can most likely trace back to decisions earlier in our life or even earlier than when we were making decisions, when we were when we had parents that made decisions for us. So I don't know if there's any early, early childhood history or a story you want to tell about your childhood to get us started. I think other than controversy was disfavored in our household. Privacy was encouraged. Um, no discussion was really um, encouraged. Um, it was pretty much uh, let's keep things quiet and non-controversial and easy. And, um, you know, that was, that was what it was. Well, isn't that fascinating that uh, no controversy and yet later on in life, you became a lawyer, which to me feels like it's, it's all about stepping into controversy. Well, you know, um, in, a, in your role as a psychologist, when people would sit next to me on airplanes and ask me the invariable, well, what do you do for a living? Yeah. As an estate planner, I normally would tell them I practice psychotherapy without a license. And I told them that because in my experience as estate planning is one of the rawest experiences that a client can go through uh, when they're thinking about their own mortality when they're thinking about what's best long term for their families um they're uncomfortable with it and they don't like doing it they put it off but they also do things that i wasn't prepared for in law school and Part of it goes to what I call the love scoreboard. How you come out in your parents' will is your final grade. And I had three different clients who were magnets of industry in the New Orleans area worth tens of millions of dollars, dwarfing their parents. And each one of these people had a problem because their parents, in one situation I'm thinking about, had four siblings, $200,000 estate between the parents. They left him $25,000. They divided the extra 25 among the other three. He actually asked me, do you think my parents only loved me twice, half as much? And he was in tears. And I'm sitting there thinking, I shouldn't have spent all that time in the business school. I should have been over in the liberal arts education, getting some schooling in psychology. No, that's, that's uh, I understand what you're saying there because you're dealing with people and emotions and big decisions that uh, actually create reactions. I have a question though, when you became a lawyer, because that's what you know my sense of you not being able to step into controversy, and then you became a lawyer. What was, uh, when you first practiced law, what did you, what were you out doing? Was it estate and planning? Oh, yes, oh no, no, I went, I decided at age 10, 10, 
that I was going to be a tax lawyer and an estate planner. Oh. And it's because my father, who was a CPA, introduced me to a local lawyer who also had his CPA. And he said, that's a good combination, Paul. Think about for the future. And I thought it sounded cool. And I was 10 years old. So when I went to law school, I had zero interest in courses like criminal law, bankruptcy, constitutional law. Tell me about estate and gift tax, successions and donations, trusts and estates. That's what I wanted. And um, I went on and got a master's in tax law from Georgetown and was taught estate planning by one of my three mentors, eventual three mentors. Came back to New Orleans, got a top flight estate planning job in a firm where scholarship was expected from, from the beginning. And, um, you know, just dove, dove right into it. And um, so I was always focused on that. Good. I, I wasn't quite clear because I think maybe I just had the stereotype of lawyer <laughs> being somebody who has to get into a fight. To but... be honest with you, to be honest with you, most lawyers detest litigation. Many lawyers who are litigators detest litigation. They simply do it because their lifestyles they've allowed to get to the level of their income and they don't have a way out. They can't go do something else. So they end up doing something they hate and it comes out sideways. You see it, alcoholism, drug abuse, uh, depression, suicide. You know, all these problems are bigger in the legal profession than in the average population. And that's a big reason why. Mm -hmm. Good, so. good point. Um, my nephew is a lawyer. And uh, I remember when he was a young kid, 10, 10 years old, and he would fight with his father. And he would go up into his room and turn up the music so loud, his father would say, shut up, stop that music. And I would go up and, and listen to the music with him. And right. Uh, so that that conflict early on with his dad was like, to me, when I look back on it now on him as an adult, that was kind of a training ground for him to be somebody who could stand up to somebody who seemed to have more power than he had. But anyway, that was just a little piece of my story about lawyers. I want to get back to something happened. I'm, I'm really glad that I've got this background and how much you loved estate planning and you got into this, uh, this firm. And then the story you just told about your, um, you know, telling people that you should have studied psychology because estate planning is really about human, human beings and choices and emotions. And so, so go back to what happened, what, like, what fell apart or what? what well, happened? you know, in 1998, when I was 38 years old, I was elected fellow in the American College of Trust and Estates Council. The average age of a newly elected fellow is over 51. So I was way early. Yes. And that is a national nomination. Uh -huh. And it is, I mean, they demand serious scholarship and speaking from their people. So I'm an Act Tech fellow at 38. I've spoken at Georgetown, at Duke, and then all the local schools, Tulane, LSU, Loyola, New Orleans. And the marriage, well, a social um, organization that I was a treasurer of, there was a political battle and I always stand up for principle. But in my case, I lost. 
And so I got voted out and essentially blackballed from New Orleans quasi society, not being a New Orleanian. Um, mm-hmm. I was not, as they would say, to the man or born. Um, but I had risen in the city to some levels and was an or- a, a, a member of several carnival organizations. And um, and president of one of the four downtown men's lunch clubs. That sounds like there was. And in uh, 2001, this happens, and I'm like, I, I quit. I, I quit caring. Paul, before you go on, I really want to. If you're able to tell me a little bit more about the detail, what was the um, conflict? I believe that the leadership was engaged in some activity that I did not think, in fact, I was pretty sure, was not in the long-term best interest of the organization. And that they were, there was some self-help involved and they were benefiting some of the members impermissibly. These are nonprofit corporations. Okay, I think I understand a little bit more. Something happening behind the scenes that you exactly. were aware of. Yeah. yeah yes. Uh huh. And so this falls apart. And then in 03, Lynn and I, well, we had been in marital counseling for eight and a half of the 10 years we were married. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, I think the event, the social event, followed by, you know, coming home one day to find my stuff strewn in the front yard of our cul-de-sac house. Um, I was, and, and I was, I was reaching a stage of burnout professionally. I loved doing what I was doing but there were some mental things going on with me that I didn't fully appreciate. And I wouldn't until 2005 when I was diagnosed bipolar and had never had that problem in my life Mm -hmm. before that time. But my maternal grandmother was, as they used to say back in the day, manic depressive. Hey, my mom was diagnosed and they call it cyclothymic, but you're right. The kind of right. high energy and the low energy. Right. And um, so there was a matter that I'd agreed to handle as an accommodation for a friend, for a client. And it dealt with representing her mother and her two sisters dealing with their elderly mother. And I wrote a will and my client's mother wanted to make sure she was included as a co-executor because she was worried that her two sisters were gonna team up on her. And I had my questions about whether the mom fully understood what was going on. But in the end, the estate was being divided equally between the sisters and they were co-executors. So I'm like, well, that's about what the result's gonna be in intestacy if she died without a will. So I notarized the will and the mom dies about a month later and they want, they need to get the estate handled. And I get a phone call from one of the top estate lawyers, one of my colleagues, representing one of the sisters. And I told her, I said, Carol, I said, there's not enough here. There's about $180,000. I said, I think that each sister has managed to worm her way into unauthorized possession 
of about $60,000 of stuff. I said, so my simple solution is we paper it up. Everybody keeps what they have. And I said, I'll do that for $300 plus cost. And Carol says, that's magnanimous of you. Yes. And I was doing it as an accommodation for my client. Well, the sisters didn't want to do that. They wanted to put all everything back and start over. So I didn't do, because I wasn't thinking clearly, what I should have done, which was fired them immediately as clients because they didn't listen to me and what was the outcome then well i didn't fire them i ignored them and that engendered a an ethics complaint against me for delaying the estate well by this time the ethics complaint is filed i have what was probably fairly characterized as an anxiety nervous breakdown Mm -hmm. and end up in a facility in Hattiesburg, Mississippi, Pine Grove. Because my therapist um, at the time did art therapy for one of their programs and she recommended it. So I went there And I got the complaint and me being an honest guy, I wrote, I said, look, I said, I'm having some problems. And um, so immediately they went to try to put me on disability. And I didn't want to do that. So they filed a petition for interim suspension based on threat of harm. Does that mean intermittent suspension from the bar? Yes, yes. Ah. And on January 11th, 2006, without having received notice of this petition or the opportunity to be heard, the Supreme Court issued the order of interim suspension. Now... I have to take a breath here because so much, (laughs) the marriage, the um, disbarment that you're talking about, and also uh, the conflict with the uh, organization that got you blackballed. My dear, that's a lot. Well, Ah, we're talking about, we were talking about voice and it's it's in all these situations, it feels like you don't have one. You can't. You can't. Well, the, the story actually gets darker. Uh-huh. Okay. Now, when I get suspended, all of a sudden, all of my national friends in estate planning and all of the contacts and people I was writing books for and manuscripts for and being paid a lot of money to write abandoned me except for one guy, he let me keep writing. My voice diminished from a leading voice in the country to essentially a disregarded squeak. And that's where I I got busted back. In 06, because I was getting hammered in the child custody, uh, child support area. Um, I developed a terrible addiction to Xanax. Oh, yeah. And I found Xanax readily available from overseas pharmacies. Um, and I was unbelievably giving them my credit card. As best I can count, in 06 and 07, I spent approximately $30,000 on Xanax. I don't know if that's a record, but it sure sounds like it. (laughs) Well, um, at the end of 07, 
I had a court order that permitted me to tell my boys good night on the phone every night. But every now and then, when I hadn't done everything she wanted, she would just deny me that right. And this one night was different. I said, look, I said, I want to tell the boys that I received a gift today of a Louisville slugger bat, a wood bat mm -hmm. from Louisville, Kentucky, real bat with my name emblazoned in the wood, like Mickey Mantle, like Ted Williams. Mm -hmm. And my boys were as big a baseball fans as I was. Permission denied. And I'd had enough. And I did something stupid. So I went to the house because I was a mile away. And I got out of the out of the car with the bat because I was intending to show the boys. Next thing I know, I'm in jail in St. Tammany Parish on a $45,000 bail for felony dangerous assault. Now, I haven't swung the bat at anybody and, and would have never. Mm -hmm. Certainly not my kids and, and even not her. I was missing for about four days. My parents were calling and I didn't answer. And um, so I, um, I finally get, and they don't let me call. Finally, on the fourth day, they let me make a collect call coming from the jail. And I'm screaming behind the operator, mom, take the call. <laughs> and then I tell her what's happened. And of course, it took my dad a couple extra days to get down there with $4,500 to bail me out. I ended up in rehab and it worked. It was a successful deal. Um, but the bottom line was my relationship with my kids was over. You know, everybody was trying to protect them from this yeah. crazy man. Right. So I attempted suicide in 06 and again in, in a well, I, well that was earlier actually I, I i overstepped that part of it there were two suicide attempts one in 06 like in june or july and one in 07 probably in march mm -hmm. and um because my life was just terrible they had taken away my ability to earn a living um taking away my voice. Um, so it was, it was, life was not good. Yeah, I understand. So. Well, this is uh, truly deep and vulnerable and beautifully real and so real that I feel like the, the people who might be listening today would say, I've been there, I've been there. Uh, what can anybody how do they find their way out of it how do they how do they survive because here you are years later down the the, the pike and we get to have a conversation with you reflecting back having made some sense obviously of what happened telling the truth declaring the truth but you your story has significance to you it's not just oh that happened and my life is over it's like you you've gone on you've you you're you're here with me yes yes i am um i always was an incurable optimist and i think that most people who practice law by themselves are that way um i never had problems getting clients or doing work that was not hard to do um, or getting paid for the work that I did. Um, you know, 
it's funny. Every now and then somebody will ask me, because I mean, it, it wasn't until the second suicide attempt that as I'm waking up in the hospital, realizing that I had yet failed again, you know, uh, you can't even do this right, you know, beating myself up because I didn't even kill myself right. Um, but what I realized was suicide is a permanent solution to a temporary problem. That's what I've heard. Yeah. And once I learned that, that never came up again and was never an option. Good. <laughs> but when you are on what I call the event horizon of the black hole of suicide and you cross onto that event horizon, I mean, it's dark and there's really no way out and you don't see it. But in the end, I found my way out because I was so despondent in the jail that I threatened suicide there. And so they put me in the suicide cage alone in a pair of gym shorts in a 40 degree jail. Yeah, a day right. later, somebody at least came and gave me a bulletproof uh, uh, like armor thing to put around me to keep, give me some warmth. But when I had my face on the jail, now that I'd gone from being one of the most successful, well-known estate planning lawyers in the country at a young age to on my face on the concrete of a jail in the suicide cage. It was a point where I said, you're better than this. You're better than this. I said, you know, it might take you a long time. And look, it has. And I got out of rehab in 08. My hearing on my reinstatement um, petition is July 13th of this year. Yeah. So it's been a long time coming. Yes. But what I had to do was regain legitimacy as a voice. And all I did, how, how I did that was just write the best stuff that was written. You know, nine books. Um, I mean, I got to know Tom Perone, our mutual friend, because Tom Perone came out of nowhere to compliment me. As he says in the very first post I ever read from Tom Perone about me, because I didn't know him, didn't know who he was. We weren't connected. He said, Paul Hood might be the best technical estate planning writer in the country and maybe in the world what an honor that's true you were seen and heard by one person is and that's the power of you putting yourself out and somebody witnessing you is what i i get today so i, I think go that well, well I, I just want to add one more thing. Uh -huh. um i think that um it requires um, humility. Um, it requires hard work. Um, it requires acceptance. Acceptance is a big thing. Um, and you need to accept things the way they are. Um, not the way you wanted them to be, not the way you think they should have been, but the way they are. 
And I always tell people, don't ever, don't ever quit believing in yourself. Because if you do, everybody else will too. And unless you've got that guardian angel, mm -hmm. you know, Clarence and, you know, it's a wonderful life, you know, earning his wings, George Bailey, um, you know, unless you've got that, um, you're your strength. Mm -hmm. In the end, you have to be your strength. So now that things are going great in every aspect of my life, a lot of it has, has been dependent on me making good choices and healthy choices. And uh, so that's involved too. Your behavior counts. Mm -hmm. What I, uh, you talked about the angels. I, when you talked about being in the cell and it felt like there was a voice because you, you, there was a transformational moment, a moment that felt like something turned for you. And it's like what they call about the small whisper that you listen to right. inside of yourself. Yeah, it was the voice said, you're better than this. Isn't that amazing? At, at a bottom, a life bottom, there's also a voice. Uh, it's more than just you being a positive uh, person. It's like in your, in your DNA, in our brains and in our beings is this voice that is always there for us. I mean, some people say it's religion, but the, mo the main thing is you, oh, Paul, you listened. I'm better than this. Or the voice was saying, hey, you, you're better than this. <laughs> and if you think about it, you know, some people would say that's kind of a cruel voice, isn't it? Like, it's challenging. You're better than this. Get up. Yeah, no, it's, it's encouraging. A different kind of, it's not a drill sergeant. It's no, an angel. No, it wasn't. <laughs> it wasn't. It uh, was, uh, you have this. Yeah. You have this. Yeah. You're better than this. Yes. Don't let this beat you. Uh -huh. I, I remember as a, as a high school kid, you know, athlete growing up in the mid seventies when coaches, you know, would pretty much abuse you under any circumstances. Um, you'd be doing a drill that was really giving you all the, all you could want. And the coach would walk by and say, don't let it whip you, son. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, don't let it whip you. Yeah. Um, the the tapping into inner strength and to the voice within then helps you. It sounds like uh, gave you hope for the future, but you just had to uh, get up and start moving <laughs> moving that's right moving that's right and that's yeah, what yeah. that's what you've done we're coming to the end and i feel like i want to make sure that the story feels complete to you how do we bring it to a close so that it feels like we're actually i i think that um i've really said what i wanted to say which was you know when, when the chips are down and things don't look good, just always remember you're better than that. Beautiful. Uh, I so appreciate your voice and resonating out to people to remind them that yes, you are, we are always, always having an opportunity in front of us. It's uh, no matter what's behind us, there's uh, our vision is if we can look ahead, we see it, we see it. And uh, I really 
am so glad that you you are who you are and you're back in the saddle and uh, get to give all of your gifts that you have obviously um, developed over the years and now the gifts of knowing this different kind of life knowing that you've lived, not just what you know about estate planning, <laughs> you know, what you know about life. You know, when I was a kid, my dad, his, his favorite album, Hank Williams recorded a number of talking records uh. under an alias, Luke the Drifter. And the Drifter was kind of the tip off because the Hank Williams band was known as the Drifting Cowboys Band. And my dad's favorite song was a song, I've Been Down That Road Before. And these are dark songs. I mean, one of them was named The Funeral. And these are talking songs and they're sad. Too many parties and too many pals. Um, Hank Williams had a real dark side to him. He had a religious side to him too. But um, I remember listening to that album many days with my dad. And when I hear that song, I've been down that road before, which are on all my iPods. And I have a bunch of Hank Williams, but um, that one is on all of them. I think about that and, and I kind of, now I'm kind of a guy who's been down that road before because I've, I've kind of been down that road. Like you introduced me, you know, I've had a lot of roles, some great defendant respondent. I can pass on those um, and be indifferent as the rest of them, including law professor, expert witness, that kind of thing. Um, but I guess it's just, I've been around long enough and had the experience and survived it all. And, and, and I just give, uh, give all the, the honor and credit to the almighty God. Cause I wouldn't have made it here without him. Yeah. This is amazing to have true life revealed and um, transformation uh, today that you shared and such a powerful, inspiring story. Thank you so much, Paul. Well, thank you, Dr. Doreen. It was a pleasure being on your show. Thank you for being with us today for this episode of Find Your Voice, Change Your Life. Each person during interviews shares what has helped them find their voice. You can learn from these guests and find your voice so you can be confident to speak up and speak out. And remember to download Doreen's free seven-step guide to fearless speaking at Doreen7steps.com. We hope you enjoyed the show and we'll return next time. Until then, goodbye for now.